بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد فعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب إشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Okay so inshallah today uh, we're going to the topic of purpose of life okay which book or which manual has that creator sent for us and we came to the Quran and we found out that uh, messengers have been coming since the first day uh, to guide mankind. It has never been that there was no guidance for mankind. There has always been a messenger guiding people to the straight path. And that's why Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ba'athna fi kulli umma, that on every nation we have sent a messenger saying what taghut, that worship only one God and leave all false deities. So from Adam alayhi salam till the Prophet salam, messengers have come and so the last of these messengers uh, who, whose message will remain till the day of judgment now because we're very close to the hour uh, the Prophet Sallallahu he raised his two fingers and he said my coming and the hour are like this that after me there is no messenger after me there is no book after me is only the day of judgment because already the over 100,000 plus messengers that had to come they've already come and gone so now there is no more after me there's no more so now we're waiting for that day and so uh, we came to the conclusion that the Prophet ﷺ is the last and final messenger based upon again not Muslim sources but, but, but rather non-Muslim sources. So Alhamdulillah this is uh, basically the pretext of what we've talked about so far. Now the thing is now that we know and acknowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one and that the Quran is the word of God and that the Prophet ﷺ is the last and final messenger. Now the question is how have they described the purpose of life? Because we, we do not know anything except what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us about the universe, about ourselves and so on. So what does Allah say, why did He make you? Obviously you have been created, you are here now. I mean why did somebody make this remote control? Why did somebody make this screen? Why did somebody make uh, the projector screen or the, or the laptop? The, you have to ask the creator why did he, did he or she build it in the first place? Likewise, for your, in, in our case and in uh, my case, we have to find out that why was I created, why were you created? And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions in the Quran why that is. So these were the three foundational principles and after that we, we actually discussed this part as well. And then so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاتَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا That we have created death and life to test you. So first things first, life of this world is a test. And so you have been created to give a test. And so right now you are you know, sitting in class and you are not having a final exam or a session or, or a quiz but yet you are still giving a test right now. Every single thing that you do is a test and you are being judged for that response. So the choice is yours. Uh, you have the freedom to choose any path you like. But the consequence uh, depends upon your actions. So a person can say I have a freedom to walk off a bridge or jump off a mountain. You have the choice to do that. But the consequence then now you have to be also responsible for that consequence. So what is a test? Test could be anything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can test you with good things and even with bad things. Like for example if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you wealth, is it a test from Allah or is it not a test? It's a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you good looks, that's also a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you children, that's also a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yet, so, and yet at the same time, if somebody close to you dies, that's also a test from Allah. And that's why the Prophet sallallahu he said that how strange is the case of a believer, that if good befalls him, he does shukr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he's grateful and that's good for him. And obviously that good thing is also good for him. And even if something bad happens to him, he does sabr and even that is good for him. Because through that sabr, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give him ranks which he could never have achieved otherwise. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, is sabirin. Give glad tidings to those who have patience. So sometimes uh, you have to have patience and you cannot uh, yani overreact and start going crazy and losing your mind over, over certain things that, that actually happen to you or what people say to you. And patience is a type of thing that does not need for you to do literally anything. You can be quiet and you could be doing patience. For example, praying salah, you have to pray salah. You know, reading Quran, you have to read Quran. But patience, I could be having patience right now and you won't even know it. Maybe uh, while I was coming here, maybe it's not that something happened like this. Maybe if I was coming here and somebody abused me, right? And I didn't say anything to this person. And yet patience is basically you do nothing, but that's some, sometimes one of the most difficult things to do. To actually do nothing. Somebody says something to you, you want to retaliate, you want to say. So, you know, every time in life there is a test 
It's like a multiple choice question. I, I personally believe that life is like MCQs. Why do I say that? For example, you go home and your mother's cooked uh, lunch for you and it, there's too much chili and uh, salt in that food. Your test has just begun. So now how do you react? That's completely up to you. You can uh, do one of the following. A, you can pick up the plate and smash it against the wall because you know you've had a long day, it's been a very hectic day for you, already you had a bad exam or a bad test and now you have to eat this food as well which is filled with chilies, it's just not good at all and you like, you just pick up the plate and you're like you know what, to hell with all of this or you do not say that, rather you, actually you don't do that, rather you say something which is very uh, demeaning or derogatory or insult, you're trying to insult your mother that uh, you know you've been spending I don't know 30 years in the kitchen and still you can't cook a decent plate of biryani well, I mean what's wrong with you you could say something like that that's also a, a, a choice you have and then you could also just say nothing and just go hmm just make a face like that that's also an option and yet another option could be that you say mom I think there's a bit too much chili and salt in this food you know what today treats on me let's order something and we'll fix this later on we'll add some more rice to it or we'll add some more water to it and we'll, and we'll try to fix this but let me treat you today so every time you go through an experience you have a choice to make and the Prophet وسلم, he always picked the best option people are throwing garbage at him yet what does he do he goes around and slaps people's faces and so no he doesn't he well, yani the people would do the worst things and yet he would act in the best way so the thing is you have the choice and you have the power to pick anything if someone's abusive, if someone's yani, insulting you, if something good happens to you, if something bad happens to you, the choice is yours. You as a human being have the capacity to pick any of these choices. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ ثُمَّ رَضَدْنَاهُ أَسْفَلَ سَافِلِينَ yani, Man has been created in the best of molds. So if you want, you can be higher than the angels also. But if you want, you can be worse than the animals. You can be worse than the rat that is in the sewers, you can be worse than the pig, you can be worse than some of the worst animals on the planet because even they don't do some of the things that we do they don't rape uh, hundreds of people they don't kill their own like in hundreds and thousands they don't drop bombs on each other you know they don't do all of those things so sometimes we as human beings, Ashraful Makhlukat can be worse than even animals so that's a choice that you have to make, you can choose to do that there are people who are very vicious and violent, sometimes you get to hear about them on the news and you think, subhanAllah, how can a human being be like this? But yet there are people like that. So the thing is, life is a test. And so, you will be judged. We will not judge you, Allah will judge you. And so Allah's judgment is completely fair. And what we have to realize is that the choices we make have a consequence. In this world, we might get away with things. It's possible. You might be the biggest serial killer on the planet and you've gotten away with everything. But not in the sight of Allah. And you might get temporary kind of justice in this world, temporary justice. What I mean by that is, let's say like Adolf Hitler, he killed 6 million Jews, 6 million. Now, he died only once. Is that justice? No. He killed 6 million and he's dying only once. And even if you hung him, even if you tortured him to death, he still died once. And so the, the justice on, at the end of the day will be established on the day of judgment itself, that's why it's called Yawm al Qiyamah is the day when it will be established so a lot of times you might get, you might pay for some of your crimes in this life sometimes you may, you might pay for all of them and you know if you get punished in, in the dunya that's actually better for you reason being that punishment here is easy to handle it's far difficult to handle it in hellfire the fire of dunya is nothing compared to the fire of hell so if you get punished here, that's kind of like a favor that you got it here yes. Okay, so the thing is, if you get punished in the world, your sins are wiped off, but depends on what you've done. For example, um, we will talk about this in detail when we talk about the chapter of sins, but the thing is, the, the punishment in dunya may relieve you of some of your sins, that's true. The Prophet ﷺ, he said that even if a thorn was to prick you, uh, through that also some of your sins are wiped off. Likewise, uh, when we go to meet a sick person, the Prophet ﷺ, he asked us to say to him, La ba's. Do not worry, tahurun uh, insha'Allah, that this is purification for you. This is a, a means for you to get your sins wiped off. But sometimes might, you, you might have done way too much and this pricking of a thorn or this disease was just not 
It's just not going to cut it. You need something more than that. Sir, so do emotional trauma by pocket? Yes. Emotional trauma, physical trauma, any kind of stress, discomfort, uh, problems, pains, all of those things are part of uh, purification. And are we accountable with the uh, Ammar we did that the, even if the sins are wiped off? If, if it's wiped off, it's wiped off. I mean, if, for example, if Allah subhanahu wa decides to, uh, yani, through that action that you went through, through that experience that you went through, wipe off your sins, then you will not be punished in the afterlife. And so you, you've, you've already cleared it. You've already gotten what uh, was the outcome of your actions. But now, inshallah, you will not be punished. But there are some sins for which there is punishment in dunya and akhira both. And, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions them in the Quran as well. Some of them he has mentioned that those who do this, this is dunya wal akhira. They, they will be destroyed in dunya and akhira. Yani this is the end of some people. So, for example, Firaun died a horrible death. He drowned. And uh, the drowning is a very painful way to go. So he died in, in drowning, but that was just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, this is the beginning of his punishment. So the, in the dunya, he was a billionaire. He was living a high life. He was enjoying himself. He could do anything he wanted. He was killing kids. Uh, you know, one year he would kill the boy. One year he would, yani one year he would leave them. Then he would kill them all. That's what he was doing. And he was very oppressive, abusive, all types of things to the point that the climax of his life was when he stood up and he said, Ana ala. I am your greatest Lord. Yani he claimed divinity himself. And so that, that became the final thing or the last straw as they say. And so he died a horrible death. He was yani, completely uh, submerged into the oceans. But Allah subhanahu wa says we are making an example out of him and we will punish him in the morning and evening, which means right now in the grave. And then Allah subhanahu wa says when the day of judgment is established, that's when his punishment will be doubled. So his punishment began at the time of death. And Allah subhanahu wa says Firaun and his armies we are punishing them. It's, a, it's in the Quran. As said, we, we are punishing them morning and afternoon. In the morning and afternoon they are being punished. And when the day of judgment is established, that's when their punishment will be doubled. So this, this ayah, by the way, is an indication of the azab of Qabr as well. That right now, Allah SWT is very clear in saying that he's being punished even right now. And right now he's in alam barzakh which what we call the state of the grave. Yes. Sir, when someone's passed away and you make prayer for them, like yeah. you know that God saves them from Qabr ka azab. Yeah. So that saving from Qabr ka azab, does that come from like their own good deeds or like say someone's children or grandchildren, if they pray, does that work too? Okay, both of these things are true. Like for example, we know that if a person has passed away, we should make dua for them. We should make lots of dua for them but because right now they really are in need of your prayers. So the more people that try to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah forgive him, but then it, it is also dependent upon who you are asking for and whether or not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself is pleased with this person overall. So let's suppose you are making dua for a complete disbeliever like for example Firaun, that Allah forgive him, have mercy on him. Obviously this person is someone that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already written off. Uh, but then there are people, average human beings who are sinners and they are good deeds and they are sins and, and good deeds. The duas of their children especially are very very effective. In a hadith we find that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yani, there, was, there, there will be a man who will go to paradise and his maqam has stopped at a certain place. Yani, he did a few good deeds here and there and that's and maybe he came up to this high. And so after that he is rising in ranks, he is rising, 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 rising and he is shocked. He is like, Ya Allah, my deeds are finished. Why am I still rising? Why am I still going higher and higher and higher? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him, you left righteous offspring who used to make dua for you. So there are two conditions here. The offspring have to be righteous. Not you, you actually left disbelieving uh, offspring or rebellious offspring who were like not very good Muslims and were sinners themselves and they used to make dua for you and call a bunch of Maulvis to their house and they would read the Quran and because what we've done in, in essence now is that we've outsourced our religion. We've outsourced it because what happens is when someone dies we call up the masjid and we say bring up like 50 kids and let them read the Quran and then do like some kind of easy load facility that they will read and transfer into the account of uh, Marhum Saab, whoever passed away. There is no easy load. You have to do your own good deeds. So yes, dua is there, but you cannot do this that you read Quran and you say, okay, now I'm transferring all of this credit into the account of so and so person. You have to do goodness now. You have to do righteous good deeds now. Because once, the, once you die, your time is up, your paper has been taken away. So this test that is life, the paper will be taken away when you're dying. No more time to write anything. When the time is up, it's up. No more five more minutes, ten more minutes, none of that. So we need to do 
lots of deeds now so that we and especially the, those deeds that will benefit us even after we're dead what is called sadaqa jariya what is sadaqa jariya like for example beneficial knowledge that you might have passed to people whatever you taught to people as long as it's spreading you are getting reward even inside the grave you built like a masjid for example you donated a wheelchair to a hospital you built a school you educated five kids you know whatever you spent on you deposited maybe uh, uh, like a water cooler dispenser somewhere and people are uh, taking from that you dug a well somewhere in a village and people take take water from that as long as that structure is there you keep getting reward for that so we need to uh, do lots of sadaqa jariya while we're alive so that even after we're dead these things are comp yani adding to our account yes so when we do like some charitable work or something good for someone else and we think i want to like do something good for that person and if that's your need of doing it we obviously you know get rewarded for it but what if we're thinking i just want to do this so that allah me rewards me and you're not really thinking about the person does that like is that still considered that's okay that's okay uh, because you can be doing good deeds for a number of reasons one of them is you do a good deed for the pleasure of allah yeah. that i only well, do it you just think i just want to be rewarded so i'm going to go out and help these kids today yeah even that's fine for example even if you say uh i i just want paradise i i i want to do something now that i want to make an investment now that will give me paradise later on so it's like a return on investment that you expecting that's even fine because the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to make dua for that allahumma inni as'aluka al-jannah oh allah give me jannah and there are many duas asking for jannah so you do it for the pleasure of allah you do it for jannah and sometimes you do it because you like that action itself for example you do it because you like helping the poor you like helping people you like the smiles on their faces when you give someone something and their life changes or they say you know what my life has changed because of you you like that feeling even that because there is sweetness in good deeds as well you know my teachers would say that uh, urdu ka sentence like they would say ke jo maza uh, pani kisi ko pilane mein na wo khud peene mein nahi hai when you really thirsty when you give uh, the glass of water you really thirsty but when you give that water to somebody else that that taste is amazing compared to if you were to drink it yourself yes uh, if someone make dua in his life what is it he did that uh, wala ko gave me for my sake then again he punished to add the jazakallah khair for the question uh, the question is that if a person has uh, made dua for himself or repented for sins will he still be punished in dunya the answer is no there are two ways to get rid of sins either you make toba or you wait for the hammer to hit you so either yani either you get punished when the hammer strikes you which it inevitably will if you keep delaying toba or you make toba now and alhamdulillah there is no sin on you now and sometimes when you make toba you come out of that as if a new born child is uh, being born into this world sinless sometimes your toba is so strong it can be a cause that you know all your sins uh, sins are wiped out but toba and istighfar is not something that is just recitation toba and istighfar is not just you know you have a you know praying beads or tasbih or something and you're like astaghfirullah astaghfirullah yet you don't wish to change yourself you don't wish to give up sins you don't wish to transform yourself so if you have the niya or the intention that you know i really wish to give up the sin and i wish to change myself then that's really istighfar the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said that remorse is repentance you know feeling remorseful regretful actually that's repentance yes okay jazakallah khair uh question is basically hukuk allah hai hukuk ibad hukuk allah yes clear you 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 ask allah allah forgives you hukuk ibad you have to seek forgiveness from those people who we have hurt now it could very well be that your seeking forgiveness might get you in more trouble than uh doing something good for you like for example if you go up to your best friend and say you know i called you this 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 and this and he's like really and you like yeah i didn't mean it though but i mean i'm really sorry that i said that you like okay fine and now you've upset them for life so if you think that by you confessing to someone uh will cause more damage and that person will not be able to understand then there are other alternatives but other than that for example uh, this does not mean that if you've taken money from someone you know you stole 10000 rupees from someone god forbid you're like you know if if i confess now that's going to kill me no you need to give that money back 
There is no way that you say, no, I'm going to keep this money and I'm going to just pretend that nothing happened. You need to give the money back. Likewise, if you've hurt someone or damaged their property, you need to say sorry and you need to try to compensate for that. Unless they say, no, no, it's okay, I'm happy with it and uh, as long as you've asked forgiveness, that's okay. So this is number one. Num number two is uh, sometimes a person might not be there in your life anymore. Maybe that person's moved to another country, maybe that person is in another city and you don't know where they are. And so you generally don't know where they are and you, re you think about it that, you know, I wish I could have said sorry for what I did to that person, but now you can't. So one of the best things is to give in charity, to uh, ask Allah SWT, oh Allah, I tried to find this person, but that person wasn't available or whatever. Or even if you try to ask forgiveness, the person is not forgiving you. The person says, you know what, I hate you and uh, I'll never forgive you. But you tried sincerely to r repent, right? But this person is like saying, no, no way am I forgiving you. So you mend your ways with Allah. You mend with Allah and you ask forgiveness from Allah and you give lots of sadaqah and charity and you, you don't badmouth this person anywhere else. And ra r rather you talk good about them. And you might say, no, there is nothing good about this person. There is good about everyone. Even I can give you good points about Firaun. You can say Firaun was a very well disciplined man. He was a man who was very focused. He was very, you, you, can, you, can, you can say good things about anyone. So the thing is, even if that person was really horrible, wherever you badmouth this person, now in those same circles, you need to say some good things about them. And, and even if people bring up the subject that, you know, that person is so horrible, you say, okay, fine. But the thing is, they also have some good qualities and those are these. So you need to undo that damage somehow. And finally, once you are sincerely repentant, and imagine you become like very righteous, very pious, your relationship with Allah is like amazing. Mashallah, what will happen on the Day of Judgment is, we find that on the Day of Judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will come to your defense. Because this person clearly did, did not forgive you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask him on the Day of Judgment, have you forgiven this person? And that person will say, no way, I need their good deeds. I need their good deeds. Because you know, on the Day of Judgment, there is no currency. The only currency is your good deeds. So if you'll have to give up your good deeds to a person. You'll have to give up your good deeds to somebody else. Your salah will go to somebody else. Your uh, zakah will go to somebody else, your fasting will go to somebody else, your tilawat of Quran will go to somebody else, your righteous good deeds with your parents will, will actually go to somebody else. So if you have wronged people, you'll have to give up your good deeds. So this person, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who, who was very pious, who made tawbah, but this person didn't forgive him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, if you forgive him, then I will give you this in return. And that person, will, when he will look at that treasure, he will say, you know what, forgiven, done. Because that treasure will be so amazing, he'll be like, I forgive him a million times, he's gone. My case is clear with him, no problem whatsoever. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will come to the aid of those people who have already made it good with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they try to repent but somehow it wasn't working out due to other circumstances. Yes. Okay, then again, same story. I mean, because as I said, if they've left the country, they've died, they, any, anything's happened that now they're not accessible. So you need to make tawbah and you need to make it good with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That, oh Allah, I am coming towards you. I am sincere in my transformation. I, I want to become a good person. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will come to your aid. But if that intention is not there, that I don't want to change myself, you know, so what that person's died, you know, whatever. Life goes on. That, that, that's not the right attitude to have. Any other? Yes. Uh, there's a space that goes around and comes around. So yeah. if you experience whatever bad you've done, wrong the other person, I love that forgiveness then. If if you do something to someone and then what happens? And do you experience the same thing? Like okay. it happens to you? Yeah, I mean, it could be that it's, uh, as I said, that punishment in the dunya can remove uh, the effect of that sin or it could be saved, some of that could be saved for the hereafter as well, unless you make tawbah. So, one of the strongest things that I can recommend is that make istighfar lots of times. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi he would say that I make istighfar 70 times in a day. Although he did not have any sins. Prophets of Allah don't sin. They can make minor errors in judgment or they can make mistakes but not sins. Yet he would make istighfar 70 times or 100 times a day. So how much is it important for us to make istighfar? So inshallah this is just an uh, overview of, of life itself and the fact that we are here in this world, it's a test. And this test is just for a little while. Just for a little while. 60 years, 70 years, 50 years, 20 years, 25 years. You never know. And so you will be judged based upon your exam. Each one of you has a different exam paper. My exam is different to yours, yours is different to mine. But Allah knows that you are capable of doing your exam paper. Allah knows your, your exam is based upon your level. Some people get very tough exams, some get fairly easy. But you know, even the fairly easy one, it might be easy for me, but it might not be easy for you. Because Allah knows our capacity. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا Allah does not burden you beyond your means. 
the kind of pressure that's upon you, Allah knows you can handle it. And Allah knows that this is, because you know in life you have different questions, like uh, different exam questions. Like one question might be 100 marks, one question might be 5 marks. So that, that time when you hit your toe against the table and it hurt, that's like a 10 mark question. But a near, near and dear relative dies, sudden death, not expecting him, him or her to die. This is maybe a 500 mark question. And maybe, you know, uh, you were going through life and you had a bad accident, maybe that's like 250 marks or 400 marks. So all of these things are tests. So, so it could be a 5 mark question, a 10 mark, and so it's happening all day long. Allah knows that you can handle those questions. Allah knows that whatever He's giving you, you can handle it. Suicide is haram for that very reason. Suicide is haram for that reason because you gave up. Because you refuse to believe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because you refuse to accept and acknowledge. You know, the solution was right around the corner and you gave up already. If you would have had sabr for five minutes, you know, you would have been fine. What happens, I mean, I've, when I was in the University of Canberra, I was doing a project over there, part of a psychological, uh, for example, study. It was called the Suicide Intervention Project. And we were dealing with cases, people who were either committing suicide or borderline suicide cases where people are contemplating suicide. And you know one of the number one reasons why people, teenagers rather, were actually killing themselves or contemplating suicide. Contemplating means you've selected where you want to kill yourself, how you want to kill yourself, but you just don't know when. That's the only question mark. It's because of pyar, ishq and mohabbat. I didn't find the girl. Uh, my life is ruined. <laughs> Uh, my boyfriend left me, life is no good, cut your uh, wrist and die. Really? Seriously? I mean, come on. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already decided your rishta for you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already figured it out. But you, you did not have enough patience to say, look, it's just, the, it's just, you know, as I say, there are plenty of fish in the sea. One person, I can understand, okay, fine, you were, you were emotionally attached to this person, but you did not have to take your life. Because by taking your life, what you've done is, you've ruined the life of your parents, your siblings, your close friends, your family members, and you've set a bad example for many of the people around you. And on top of that, you have disbelieved in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well, when he told you that he will, not, he will not burden you beyond your means. So it is impatience and it's uh, ingratitude for the favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes. Okay, now we will talk about depression in detail inshallah, uh, but uh, let, me, let me put it this way. If a person went through a, an actual mental condition, an actual mental condition, sometimes it's related with other issues and which, which I will explain later on. It is a lot, a lot of times depression is a spiritual issue. It's something that it, it, to, to do with a lot of Islamic stuff that we will read inshallah. Uh, and, and, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that in the Quran as well. He, he for example says, Allah bi zikrillahi tatma'inul qulub. Only in the remembrance of Allah will your hearts find rest. So it is distance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But sometimes it could be a severe mental condition. Maybe a person was going through borderline mental retardation or something like that. If that ha happens, that a person is actually a medical case where they have lost their sanity, they have lost, then they are not to blame. From that point onwards, before that they will be judged. For example, a person. Uh, goes into coma. A person uh, loses their memory and becomes mentally disabled. A person uh, dies or something. Any, all of these things, for example, before this, whatever you were, you will be accountable for that. But not after, because one of the conditions for you to be judged is that you have to be of sane mind. If you're insane and you're doing bad behavior with other people, then you are not to blame for that. If you are unconscious and you are doing things, like for example, if you uh, murder someone in your sleep, God forbid, I don't know how that will happen, but let's suppose you murdered someone in your sleep, then you are technically not to blame for that. Because this was not a conscious choice you make, maybe you, you know, accidentally pushed somebody off the cliff or something, you were like sleeping, they were like camping or something, I don't know how that would happen or why that would ever happen. Still, you know, even if you did it unintentionally, someone lost their child or yeah. their sibling or whoever, it yeah. maybe so how is just a self? Okay, okay, so the thing is, uh, in Islamic Sharia, and now we're getting very technical now, in Islamic Sharia, if you uh, kill someone unintentionally, then there is still the case of blood money that has to be paid, but you don't uh, die for that, because 
the punishment for death is death right for example if you kill someone murder someone then the the uh, the punishment is to kill this person but the thing is if you unintentionally kill someone like for example it's a car accident and and then again even that is debatable because sometimes it's completely unintentional and sometimes it is called reckless endangerment so in both cases the punishment is different for example if you kill someone actually unintentionally like for example uh, it was something completely harmless that you were doing and as a result of that somebody like for example you were reversing your car and underneath your car a person was sleeping and you had no possible way of knowing why on earth would a person sleep under your car but they were sleeping under your car because very hot and they were, and so you reversed it and you accidentally went over them now the thing is you're not to blame for that and so you would put your case in there and they would realize that this was a complete uh, unfortunate thing that actually happened you're not to blame they would still ask maybe you or the community or the people around to come up with the blood money because that person still lost their life and their family has to be compensated or maybe the government will pay on your behalf depending on the yani situation but if for example you were driving at 100 kilometers an hour on a road that's said 60 kilometers then definitely this is what is called manslaughter it's it's not murder but it's manslaughter it's not uh, yani you actually took out a gun and you were actually shooting people in a drive by but rather you were recklessly endangering yourself and others around you for that to go at yeah so now the case is a bit different so there are different situations and there are different consequences no i would like to say it wasn't because uh, it was actually just bad weather bad weather and uh, uh, because it was like a 400 car accident so uh, that's why when the uh, when the government decided they said that you know each one of yours insurances will pay for yourselves because when the accident happened it was just a, a bunch of it was like very foggy there's a lot of rain and uh, one of the cars it slipped it hit the side uh, of the road and then it kind of collided with everything else there and so the whole road was blocked four lanes all blocked and so each car that was coming couldn't see what was happening in front so it was a complete like uh, a wall of cars and everybody kept hitting everybody and so nobody could stop because the, you even if you applied the brakes the road was so slippery and so foggy you couldn't see anything so when i hit someone i was hit by a police car i i was hit by a police mercedes and so the guy he came out and he says uh, uh, who who hit you i said you hit me he says wallah i said yes you hit me brother and he says okay fine let's forget about that because initially they were thinking that you know whoever you hit your insurance will pay for them but it was such a big mess because so many people hit so many other people that the government announced that you know your insurance will just take care of you don't don't worry about your insurance will pay this because then you have to fill a lot of paperwork and all that so they said let's make it simple whoever's got like damaged car whatever your insurance will inshallah cover all of that so the government again can decide in such situations what the consequence will be now this is the first thing that life is a test that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the quran so this is the one thing that you have to understand number 2 is allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also mentions wa ma khalaqtul jinna wal insa illa liya'budun that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says and i created not the jinn and mankind except that they should worship me so the reason for your creation is the worship of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala anything else you do is a cherry on top or a bonus but the main reason why you're here is to worship allah so by the way let me just make this clear the word worship here is not very a very good translation and i admit that because there are not many words that i can use for illa liya'budun ya'budun basically comes from ibada or being an abd of allah or ubudiya you know, all of these words which basically means to enslave yourself okay enslavement but enslavement now when we think about slavery it has negative connotations so i want to explain this word so that you understand why we are here on this planet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says wa ma khalaqtul jinna wal insa i have not created you for any purpose except that you enslave yourself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in obedience and worship anything else you do is a cherry on top or bonus but the main reason why you're here is to worship Allah now worship does not necessarily mean just the five daily prayers or fasting the month of ramadan or going for hajj and giving zakat that is obviously worship but worship as i told you in the first class i think that worship could be eating food as well worship could be going to uh, your workplace worship could be exercising all of these things would be an act of worship depending upon your intentions it could become an act of worship if you are studying psychology and you think about it that oh allah i am studying psychology okay fine i want to get a job in the future and i want to be a psychologist but also because i want to help humanity and through that i want to please you because i have certain skill sets and i realize that if i become a psychologist i can really treat people well and i can really bring benefit to mankind if i do this 
inshallah you studying psychology books will be recorded as an act of worship and you can think about it that you know I will charge an arm and a leg yani when you become a psychologist inshallah you can think about this that I will charge people a fortune I will charge them 5000 rupees a visit just to listen to them for like 20 minutes and even that I would say hmm achha theek that's it and every occasionally I will ask the question how does that make you feel you know that's what I will do and I will charge them 5000 for just one visit that's okay you can still do that but you can think about it now that you know ya allah if there are people who can't afford it inshallah i'll keep one day in a week where i will treat them for free or maybe i'll have an application form where those who can't afford my fees uh, can actually fill the form and i can treat them on a specific day i can call them all for, uh, after appointment and they can come and they can actually uh, get themselves tested so this is if, if you do it this way alhamdulillah your deeds here will be an act of worship so worship could be anything now the thing is when we talk about the word slavery and that's what ibada or ubudiyah or being an abd of allah really literally means slavery in the modern context is a very negative term because in the modern context the slave hates the master the master hates the slave the master beats the slave the slave has literally no rights and uh, so on and so forth but in islam slavery with allah subhanahu wa taala that we become slaves of allah is an amazing thing first of all it is a beautiful relationship because Allah he loves the slave and the slave loves Allah because our slavery begins with alhamdulillah rabbil alamin all praise and thanks is due to Allah who is not just my rabb not just my master but the master of everything ar rahman ar rahim and he is not uh, uh, an oppressive tyrant ruler he is he is rahman and rahim he is the most beneficent the most merciful everything of goodness that i have right now is from Allah he has given me eyes and ears and its ability to eat good food and enjoy myself and walk in the sun and run in the rain and all of these things and this is a pleasure this is a gift from allah that i can enjoy my life all of it is from allah and so you praise allah subhanahu wa taala and then you know if somebody was to give an ad in the newspaper that i am looking for slaves who wants to be my slave no salary no nothing i will beat you and da 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 who who wants to go right nobody gives an ad for a slave i am looking for slaves right now yet you can look for employment you know because there is a difference between a servant and a slave a servant whether he is in your house or he is a government servant is a servant they get a salary they do a job they serve you they get a job uh, they, 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 they actually get money for it and a servant can any time say you know what to hell with this i am leaving and there is nothing you can do about it you can just say okay fine and and he simply walks out but a slave can't do that slave can't say you know what i have had too much i quit you can't quit once you are a slave you are a slave but we willingly come into the slavery of allah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't advertise this uh, we say iyyaka na'budu wa iyyaka nasta'in you alone we enslave ourselves to or you alone we worship lack of better word you alone we worship you alone we ask for help so we ourselves are saying every single day in every single prayer in every single raka you alone we enslave ourselves to and you alone we ask for help so every day you renew that vow that oh allah we belong to you and we're going to come to you and so we say allah is rabbil alamin he is rahman he is rahim he is malik yawm ad din and then we say oh allah iyyaka na'budu wa iyyaka nasta'in you alone we worship you alone we ask for help but then when we say our salam assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah assalamu alaykum then when we walk out we act like other than slaves because when you are a slave of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you walk talk and act like a slave of allah that allah is my master whatever allah says that's what happens so you can eat good food you can wear good clothes no problem but you have to be obedient to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala slavery is obedience so in that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam who was the best of mankind he would say that know me as nothing more than abduhu wa rasulu know me as the slave of allah because that is a title that he loved for himself wa rasulu and his messenger so now let me give you the million dollar deal which is how is slavery such an awesome thing if it's slavery to allah you know in this world you are there is a concept which i like to call cool by association cool by association is that if you hang out hang out with cool people you become what you become cool by association you yourselves are not cool at all but because you're hanging out with cool people you give the impression that okay you are a cool person as well imagine yani in o levels or a levels or high school whatever if there is some cool in the case of boys 
bhaijans in the school or in the case of girls you know bajis in the school if you hang out with them who who are known in the university or the school as being the cool people then if you simply hang out with them rub shoulders with them then by default you become cool as well and if you tell people you know i'm hanging out with those girls there they're like really seriously yeah yeah of course look i'll i'll wave them and they'll wave back hey and they're like oh and they're like wow you you seriously know them and maybe you don't know them you just waved and they just waved back but you become cool by association everyone looks up to you now not because you have any value but because they have value and so you have become cool by association so this is a like a common thing and when i was teaching business research a few years ago we we came through a case study done by uh, lee's jeans there's levi's and then there's lee's and lee lee jeans what they basically did was in the 1970s or 80s they became they began to be known as mom and pop jeans meaning that these are the kind of jeans that parents would wear so they were a bit, they were a, they were a bit baggy and so on so they became known as jeans that maybe parents would wear so the kids weren't wearing those jeans kids were wearing levi's and other wrangler or uh, maybe for other brands so what happened was lee had to change their image completely so they rebranded themselves the logo changed they did a few things here and there they changed some of the stitching on their jeans as well and they made them a bit trendy and then now because the impression was so bad that if somebody found out oh so you're wearing lee jeans oh mom and pop jeans you became uncool automatically just by wearing lee jeans you became uncool so what they did was they did something phenomenal and they went to universities and colleges and schools and high schools and all that and they investigated for 6 months who are the coolest people in each given university so they sent their representatives to put up a stall somewhere and they found out through word of mouth and chatter and things like that who are the coolest people in school and so they identified like maybe five boys and five girls who were like who everybody respected even though they were they had bad behavior or whatever but they were looked up to as cool people so they identified them in different schools and colleges across the US and finally what they did was after 6 months of observe uh, of of observation they finally gifted these uh students uh five pair of jeans each blue dark blue black gray whatever and so what happened was because it was a gift and now they started wearing them lee jeans became like the coolest thing in town because the cool kids were wearing it so now everybody else said oh did you know that they were in lee jeans lee jeans really seriously oh, okay so everybody started buying lee jeans so it, it happens that you have an effect when you influence a certain uh, aspect of society then others follow some people are born leaders are natural leaders others simply follow along so that's what we call cool by association why am i mentioning all of this imagine yani if you are associated to the president of pakistan or the prime minister you, you're like sorry no nobody would know but in the in the government sphere for example if you are going past like a police check post and they stop you and you say to them do you know who i am and the guy says no i don't know and you say i am and you pull out a card and say i am the secretary to the president like who and he automatically because of the power that you have he becomes shocked and he he like salutes you and lets you go likewise if you're in the armed forces and they stop you at a check post even if you're in like civil uniform or or civil clothing they say stop the car get out let me check your license like, do you know who i am i am major so and so like sir salute and then you go because why because because of your association to the armed forces because of your association to the president or the prime minister because of your association to the chief of police if you say do you know who i am i am the advisor to the to the president i am the advisor to the general i am the advisor to so and so so you are not the president you are not the general but you are an advisor or you work in his uh, in his office or whatever so just by that virtue alone they let you go because of your association now tell me something if you are associated with allah subhanahu wa taala that they stop you to check for and you say do you know who i am i am a slave of allah abduhu i am i am a slave of allah subhanahu wa taala then obviously that might mean mean absolutely nothing in the streets but that has huge implications on your character and in the hereafter because you walk around like someone who's part of the clan of allah subhanahu wa taala what we call hizbullah or hizbur rahman they are the party of allah subhanahu wa taala you know uh, in the mafia not that i've ever been in part of a mafia never been that bad <laughs> but uh, it, when you're part of a mafia and they protect you and often times i've seen this behind like a bumper sticker behind cars protected by mafia or something like that so if you are if you are part of a gang or a big mafia 
uh, in the Italian mafia, what they would do is like the typical godfather situation is when uh, someone from the mafia is introducing a new person to the gang, he would say, he's a friend of mine. Or he would say, he's a friend of ours. If he says he's a friend of mine, this is a signal that kill him. That once we're done with the meeting, kill this person. I, I couldn't care less. And if he says he's a friend of ours, then it means that he's to be respected. Because when he says he's a friend of mine, it means he's a friend of mine, but not of yours. So when he's introducing someone to the mob by saying, hey, meet Tony, he's a friend of mine. That means kill Tony as soon as this meeting is over. And if he says, hey, meet Tony, he's a friend of ours. He means he's a friend of ours. He's our friend, he's part of the mafia, he's not going to be a snitch on us, he's not going to do this, so he's part of the gang. So when you say, I'm Abdullah, I'm a slave of Allah, then automatically you become not just cool, you become like ultra cool by association. Because now you're not associating yourself to any human being, you're associating yourself to the one who has power over all things. La hawla wa la quwata illa billah. The one who is al-qawi. So that itself is a great honor for us, just to be in in that category. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defines them as Ibadur Rahman, the slaves of the most merciful. And what are their attributes, what are their qualities? That when they walk on the earth, they walk with gentleness and humility. And they pray their prayers, they give their zakah, and how they are, they are, they are the slaves of Allah. And these are certain qualities because it is a litmus test for us to compare ourselves, do I have those qualities? Do I even fall in the category of Ibadur Rahman? And so this is something that we can keep testing ourselves on. So when you become a slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is one of the most beautiful things. And the Prophet sallallahu who was the best of mankind, wanted to be known with the same title. So this is uh, what we understand to be the purpose of life. Now if you want to become a doctor, an engineer, a, a psychologist, no problem. But first things first, you have to be a slave of Allah. If you become a doctor, or a psychologist, or an engineer, yet you are not a slave of Allah, then technically you have failed your purpose in life. If I was to take a matchbox and I was to dip it in a glass of water for five minutes, what's the purpose of a matchbox by the way? Light. To light a fire. The purpose of a matchbox is to light a fire, Other, otherwise it's pretty useless. Now if I dip it in water and take it out, now will it fulfill its purpose? No it won't. Now you can take that matchstick and you can make matchstick men out of it or you can make some small little house out of that, you can do some creative stuff. But that was not the purpose of the matchbox. The purpose was to light a fire and now although you are doing many other things with it, but the purpose of that thing has died, it's gone. But sir, say if you're a doctor, you're basically saving lives and yes. people. So that doesn't mean that you're not doing anything for God. Right. The thing is, you have to do it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like for example, if I, let me give you an example, if, if, if I am hired by uh, a company, there's building A and there's building B, I'm hired by building A to work for me for a month and they will give me a salary of 1 lakh rupees. And then I don't show up to work once, rather I keep working for building, building B for one whole month. At the end of the month, I go back to building A and I say, look, I've been working, give me my salary. They will do what with me? They'll kick me out or slap my face or something like that, right? Because they'll be like, okay, you were working, but not for us. You were working for somebody else. So on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to those people who did righteous good deeds, apparently, but not for Allah. He will say, seek reward from whosoever you did it for. You, you did it for yourself, go seek reward for yourself. But on that day, nobody will be able to reward you except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some people did it for maybe uh, a prophet or a saint or something like that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, go and ask them. Let's see if they ask something today. So the thing is, your intentions have to be for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Otherwise, our deeds become useless. So... The purpose is, you, you can do anything you like, anything you want to get into, inshallah that's fine, as long as you remember that I'm a slave of Allah and I can never disobey Him. And so I should try my level best, even then you will make mistakes, no problem. I should try to keep, even if I make mistakes, I get back up, I try to do righteousness after that point. So that's what we understand. So just like a matchbox would fail its purpose, in the same way human beings can fail their purpose uh, in this life as well. So Islam we say is a 24-7, 365 way of life. All of these could be an act of worship, prayer, studying, eating, playing, friends, work. All of this could be there if it is done with the right intentions. If it is done keeping in mind that I'm not disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in anything. Hanging out with your friends is not an issue. But if you're like partying in a club or something, this is an issue. Uh, playing is not an issue. But if your playing is causing you to badmouth people, 
and insult people and, ab and use abusive language and uh, do all of that and, and make you a worse person, then that playing is not okay for you. Right? If your playing involves betting and gambling, it's not good for you. If your having fun or eating means you're going to have alcohol and uh, stuff that's haram, then that eating is not an act of worship. So whatever you're doing, just make sure it's not in disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you're clear. But if you're having fun or studying or something, sometimes you might be studying and it might not be good for you. What if you're studying how to make uh, chemical weapons that will destroy mankind completely? And you're studying it for this reason that I want to work with, a, with some global army that is going to wipe people out, make phosphorus bombs and uh, you know, uh, brutally kill people to death. So that's not okay. Or for example, if a, if a girl decides that I want to go to Paris and learn fashion design so that I can make uh, what, what I like to call wale kapde, where the clothing is very little and I want to make these outfits and I want the, everybody to wear them and I want the guys to wear them, the girls to wear them and I want just everybody to just be all that then this is not okay for you because this is in direct disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so learning fashion design not an issue but if you do it with the intention that I want to create like the most skimpiest outfits out there and I want, to, I want the world to see them and I want models to go up on the catwalk and do all of that then this is not okay so whatever you're doing just make sure that there is no elements of disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that if there is, then we need to rectify uh, the stuff that we're doing, inshallah. Okay, so I say that the most practical religion is Islam, and the more you study it, subhanAllah, you understand that everything about it is completely practical. Yeah, that even from the, uh, as part of Sharia, yani, you know, when I talked about Quran, and I talked about how uh, the Quran has many miracles, I mentioned the miracle that I find in, in the Quran is that the law it gives out, it's so perfect. Because when you study it in depth and you try to come up with solutions to what could have been the solution to this, what could have been the solution to that, and you find out that the solution that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has recommended is the best one ever. Even for example, you might think that uh, cutting the hand of the thief or uh, uh, for example, uh, yani for example, uh, lashing someone who's committed zina or killing someone in the case that they were married and you might think, oh my God, that's too much. But when you think about it deeply and you look at all the possible op options that could have been out there and the, and the repercussions of all of these actions, you find that whatever Allah has recommended is actually the best solution. For example, you might be like, why do you want to cut the hand of a thief if he's committed a sin? It's okay. First of all, the hand of the thief is not cut if the thief stole like a chocolate or a candy from the market. There has to be a certain value attached to it before you say that now the hands can be cut. And what happens is that when one person's hand is cut, it creates this deterrence in the society that nobody else then steals after that. Because what we do often times in movies and Hollywood and all that, we sympathize with the sinner. We sympathize with the one who's committed the sin. And we're like, no, but you're going to cut his hand, he's a poor guy. And they put the whole drama behind it that this sentimental music starts playing and the shots rowing, the kids crying and all. They make the whole scene out like that. And they pretend like this guy was a saint, but the only mistake he made was he stole like some a million dollars here and there or whatever, you know, it's, it's okay, he's a poor guy, you know, leave him. So they do that, but what happens is that you don't look at the person from whom he stole. Maybe there's an old man who's trying to get his daughter married off and the only savings he had was like, I don't know, 10 lakh rupees, which this guy conveniently stole and he blew it on drugs, alcohol and all of that. And so now you're like, no, please, please, sorry. what about this guy? How is he going to be re any, uh, recompensated for what happened to him? And so we don't look at the full picture. Yes. So it's fine if you steal from a millionaire. From a millionaire? No, you you, you don't have that. It's even if e even if I mean we, we we don't judge based upon who has what. We are not allowed to steal. We, we we don't steal. Even like the concept of Robin Hood is not from Islam. Like for example, you become this self-professed vigilante or a righteous person that I'm going to rob from the rich and give to the poor. You can't go into people's houses and start to steal stuff from them, even if they might be extremely rich. So that's number one. Number two is, uh, for example, you know punishments that, for example, uh, involve that the person has to be killed. And so we, sing, we end up saying stuff like, you know, one person died, do you have to kill the other one? Okay, fine, he killed someone, do you have to kill him too? Yes, because other, if you don't, if, and Allah SWT says in the Quran that in this qisas is hayat for you, is life for you. Meaning in his death is life for you. How is that possible? Because when you kill one person, then it will prevent 10,000 others from being killed. 
because in a country when or in a place where which is so much lawlessness when you can get away with murder then murder becomes the norm so when you show people that you know what we will bring people to justice and if you kill someone you will be and if a person for example cheats on his wife with another woman this person is killed the next time any husband thinks about cheating he'll think a million times because he'll be humiliated he'll be embarrassed and then he will be executed as well so he'll think a million times ask the woman who is suffering from that and you know they did a survey like this in the states they asked a group of men who um, whose wives ran away with somebody else and they asked them that you know how do you feel about that case and so on and you know the unanimous answer across the board pretty much the same was that if you would have told us that she had died that day that would have been easier for us to handle than for you to tell us that she ran away with somebody else because now I want to kill her myself and sometimes they do they end up committing murder and so then it, they're like you know what he killed someone this guy is crazy you know he's not crazy he's acting out of his own passions a woman might end up killing her husband when she finds out that he's being uh, yani, uh, charged with infidelity and all of these things and so justice delayed is justice denied there was a woman in uh, India, there was an article I think last year, I don't know, it was October or September, last year, so a year ago. Uh, and this woman basically she uh, took a big knife, like a butcher's knife or something, and she cut her husband into pieces. She cut him into pieces. And so she was from a village. And so the news came out, they're like, wow, this woman is crazy, she's a psycho. She's not a psycho. I'm telling you, she's not a psycho she's just acting on justice delayed because she found her husband raping her own kids and so she saw she her daughters were telling them that our father is doing something and they were very young they were young kids like seven eight years old and they were saying something but she didn't believe them one day she accidentally came home early she was out in the fields cutting I don't know grass or something she came home early and she found the husband doing it she took this thing out and she just cut him into pieces the reason why she did that, if you look at it from an uh, anthropological uh, standpoint, is because she knows that uh, there is no way of me getting justice here. If I take him to the court of law, I'm going to get slapped around and I, I, I won't get justice. But when the people know that there is justice, and if you go to the courts, you will get your uh, claim for that, then the society has no facade in it. Otherwise, you're causing facade. When you do not act upon that, like for, like for example, even people who... Uh, who become uh, who, who take the law into their own hands and sometimes do very horrible acts of terrorism oftentimes when you look at it is because it's not a religious thing that they're doing it's not religious at all Islam has got nothing to do with it it's simple human rights it's a simple human rights violation a person whose house is bombed and their kids die parents die everything that they've ever loved is dead Islam's got nothing to do with it this is now going to be an act of passion this is now going to be vengeance. It's got nothing to do with Islam. The person now is he's completely non-practicing. Maybe he never prays five times at all. He doesn't even pray, he doesn't fast, doesn't do nothing. Yet he's a Muslim by name. And so he goes around bombing people or something because now he's just fed up and he knows that there's no way that I will get justice for this. So they say justice delayed is justice denied. Yes. Will that woman be punished or not? Well, first of all, the courts let her free. They did not punish her. They just sort of gave her a slap on the wrist and they sent her off and so uh, the issue if she was for example a Muslim woman and if she was a, uh, a pious woman we say that we, we, we leave that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we don't know what's going to happen to her because the thing is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may forgive her because the stuff that she suffered through was terrible uh, maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might because still it's an act of desperation and impatience and not trusting in Allah so it's not as serious as you actually going out and killing someone Obviously you can understand and you know they actually call it uh, crimes of passion and the punishment for that is not that high. Even in the courts of law that we have now, the, when you are, it's an aggravated assault, when somebody was aggravating you and you killed him, that's different than just to go out and kill someone because you didn't like them or you wanted to scheme against them or, or plot against them. So they will sometimes even put this under manslaughter that this person was asking for it. Allah gave him 
اللہ کی باتیں اللہ کو پتہ ہوتی ہیں وہ اللہ عالم ابھی کیسے ایوری تھنگ از اے پلان والا سمارا ایوری تھنگ از فرام دا قدر آف اللہ اینڈ دے سی دا لارڈ ورکس ان مسٹیریس ویز یس اٹس ٹرو بٹ دین اگین آئی ایم نو ون ٹو سی وٹ واز دا انٹینٹ بہائنڈ آل آف دیٹ آئی جسٹ لک ایٹ دا فیکٹس اینڈ آئی لائک اوکے وٹ ہیپن ویری ٹریجک تھنگ بٹ اسٹل یو نو ہاربل پرسن گاٹ اے ویری ہاربل اینڈ لائک وائز دا ٹنس آف ادر اسٹوریز آف پیپل بینگ بجٹ لائک دس بیکاز جسٹس واز ناٹ بینگ سرو یس نہیں سوسائڈ آپشن نہیں ہے سوسائڈ ناٹ این آپشن یو آر ناٹ الاؤڈ ٹیک یور اون لائف بیکاز دیکھیں یہ میں آئی آئی کین ناٹ کامنٹ آن جنرلی آئی ووڈ سے کہ جنرلی آئی ووڈ نیور ایڈوائز آئی ووڈ نیور ایڈوائز اینی ون ٹو کل سم ان ایدر آئی ووڈ ناٹ سی دیٹ یو نو ایف یو آر یو فائنڈ یور ہسبینڈ ڈوئنگ سم تھنگ ہاربل یو شوڈ پک اپ دا ساڈ اینڈ چاپ ایم ان ٹو پیسز آئی ووڈ ناٹ ایڈوائز دیٹ دس از اے ویری انفارچونیٹ تھنگ دیٹ دیٹ ایکچولی ہیپن ایز اے ریزلٹ آف سم تھنگ دس کوڈ ہیو بین ڈن ان مینی ان اے مچ مور بیٹر وے فرام دا اسلامک اسٹینڈ پوائنٹ دا پنشمنٹس آر دیر فار ریزن ٹو اسٹاپ سوسائٹی فرام ڈوئنگ دس اینڈ آل دو دیر آر لاڈ آف bad things we can say about the Saudi government and how they uh, are and how they act and behave and all of those things. But one thing that's good there is that people have the freedom to leave their shops open in broad daylight and go to attend the prayer. It's a jewelry store. It's open, wide open. They go to a, the uh, a mosque right next door to pray, come back, nothing stolen. Even in the States, what happened was there was a blackout for some time and they robbed the whole place. In the UK, it happened a few years ago when uh, people were stealing, there was, uh, I don't know, blackout, electricity malfunction, something happened, and people in Mercedes were stealing. There was a girl who was the son of a very rich man. She was driving a Mercedes, C-class, convertible Mercedes. She gets out, she breaks the door of one of the designer boutiques, she uh, takes a few uh, clothes in the car, and, and, they, and they ask her, that, you know, you have money, why are you stealing? She said, everybody's doing it, you know? A sale is a sale, who cares? <laughs> and there were people who were stealing PlayStations, Xbox, LCDs. I mean, they're not people stealing food. They're not people stealing water. They're people stealing Xbox, PlayStation, uh, jeans, you know, designer shoes, because they had the opportunity, so they said, might as well. So the thing is, a society where you let people go and you remove the law for five seconds, this is what happens. Because morally we have not trained them. The only reason why they aren't stealing and doing all that is because of that hammer that's hanging over their heads. That if the police catch you, you're in trouble. So the thing is you have to train people in order to realize that you know you have to sort of uh, develop the whole society. As Allah SWT says, Inna Allah la yughayru ma bi qawmin hatta yughayru ma bi anfusihim. Allah will not change the condition of a people until they change that which is within themselves. Until I change myself, Pakistan, Pakistan will not change. Until you change yourself, Pakistan will not change. But it's easier to say, you know, they have to change, they have to change, you know, the political uh, structure is messed up, the police is messed up, the railway is messed up, the, the uh, customs is messed up, uh, our education system is this. What, what about me? What about me? Am I messed up? Am I also someone who is not right? So the thing is, if I fix myself and everyone starts to fix themselves, then the country becomes a better place, inshallah. So Islam gears you towards that. It, it teaches you to work on your character and then it has laws in place that if at all people do exceed the boundaries then there is some punishment for them because in any given society not everybody will be righteous there will be some miscreants some people who will cause fitna they will, they will actually cause fasad and there has to be some rules for them so Islam is a religion that is practical and it looks at everyone it looks at the priest it looks at the scholar it, it, it looks at the preacher the teacher the student the child the mother, the father looks at everyone holistically. So, uh, so Allah subhanahu ta'ala is looking at everything and that's how he makes the law. It's not favoring one person or the other person, it is a general law. Because even now, if I give you guys the ability that you know what, this class will make the law for the whole world. You guys. You know what type of law you will make? This is my, this is my honest prediction. It will be hugely in favor of students somehow, I have a feeling. It will be like, you know, give students every day 1,000 rupees just for the heck of it, make cafeteria free, uh, and so on and so forth. What this will do is, yes, you will get your perks. But because you will get your perks, somebody else will suffer as a consequence. Your faculty will suffer, your HOD will suffer, and other people will suffer, even your parents will suffer. 
because you are only looking at it from your perspective and after 20 years when your kids will be in university नहीं बट आप लोग फिर अयाश हो जाएंगे ना बहुत ज्यादा सो वट विल है वेन योर किड्स कम टू यूनिवर्सिटी देन वट विल है यू विल हेट योर लॉ यू लाइक वाई वॉज एक्चुअली वाई डेट मेक दैट लॉ बिकॉज नाउ माई किड्स आर डूइंग दिस एंड सो दे हैव बिकम सो रिबेलियस सो द थिंग इज इफ आई ओके इफ आई टेल द टीचर्स ऑफ कॉम्स फॉर एग्जाम्पल दैट ओके यू गाइज गेट टूगेदर एंड यू मेक द लॉ फॉर द वर्ल्ड वट विल आर लॉ लुक लाइक इट विल लुक लाइक टीच वन डे सेवन सिक्स डेज यू टेक ऑफ vacation and you and and university paid vacation and and you can, and, and the university will send you to uh, different locations every week and they cannot repeat that location so they will send you to the states then they will send you this so the teacher has to be well traveled the teacher has to know every culture of the world so they have to do this and subhanallah so every day sometime we come with a tan and like yeah it was great hawaii it was beautiful and so we you know talk about that so we would make laws like that which would be hugely in favor of teachers all across the world and so we we might overlook the rights of the doctors the lawyers the x y and z so when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes the law he made us and so he knows everyone and so he is looking out for everyone that this is the right of the husband this is the right of the wife this is the right of the child this is the right of the grandparents this is this is the right of the teacher the student the administrator the persons in authority those who are under him and those as well and so the whole system when you look at it and the more in depth i study islam i tell you i fall in love with this religion i loved islam before too yani when i became a muslim formally you you can say when i accepted islam properly i loved islam but when i start, started to study sharia and islamic law i was like man this is this is the best in the world and i can challenge you that you pick up a book on sharia and if you have the uh, time to study through it and go through it and look at the reasons what have been mentioned by our scholars that why certain ahkam have been there for reason i'm telling you is the best <clears throat> you know even things like uh, the son gets the share from the father and the daughter gets half of that and, the, and you're like but this is so unfair it's not seriously if you look at it it's not unfair at all because the son is only inheriting from the father but the daughter is inheriting from the father the brother her husband so she's getting from everywhere and the and the son is actually supposed to it's fard upon him to spend on his wife and his kids he has to otherwise he'll be sinful but the wife whatever she earns it is 100% her own she does not have to give one rupee to her husband or to her kids she can blow it all on shoes and handbags <laughs> she can do it and she will not be sinful but if she wants to give to her husband she can and that will be her ihsan on her husband if she wants to spend on her kids that's her ihsan on the kids but whatever she earns that is 100% her own property so therefore she gets half from here half from here half from here and then she can use that money wherever she likes the husband whatever he gets he is now responsible for his mother because if his father is passed away the mother is there he has to take care of his mother he has to take care of his wife his uh, kids even his sisters so he is now looking out for everyone so allah subhanahu wa taala has made it in a way that it is balanced <clears throat> and even so you find that uh, each of these things for example i i, I was actually reading um, the uh, british law or the english law of inheritance you know one of the most predominant laws there that the lords over there follow is that everything is inherited by the first son the elder son everything everything the younger brother gets nothing the sisters get nothing what if he wants to he can otherwise the law says he get, the eldest child inherits everything in eldest male child inherits everything and then if there is no eldest male child and the the guy the lord who died only has girls then his next nephew gets it his uh, brother's son number 1 if he has no brothers and they don't have or, or they don't have any sons then his sister's son the son has to get it if there are no sons then his cousin's son will get it it has to be a male child and it has to be from within his family somewhere so that, uh, therefore they have those you know those uh, things that you know a random third cousin gets an inheritance of a million dollars is like how do you know your uh, great nephew's this that or the other he passed away and he had nobody else except you and so you get, say wow that's amazing he had girls they couldn't get it but in in islamic law that's not the case 
if there is no son then everything goes to the mother and the daughters and so on and so and maybe to a few members who are right left and right that's it it stays it stays within the family to develop that particular family so when you look at it from even the most nitty gritty aspects you find that everything makes sense that's why i say that islam is the most practical religion and the more you study it the only reason why people complain about the sharia is because they don't they don't understand it they have no understanding of it i'm telling you the moment you start to study it in depth alhamdulillah it makes sense okay let's take one question before we end are all religions the same are all religions the same same source so no matter how you die it's okay no no or yes no okay so all religions yes they came from the same source because adam alayhi salam was the first human being and so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through him uh, allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that ya ayyuha an-nas taqu rabbakum allazi khalaqakum min nafsin wahida wa khalaqa minha zawjaha wa batha minhuma rijalan kathiran wa nisaa that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking mankind that, oh mankind you should all fear allah as you should be feared because he created you from a single person adam and from him he created his wife and from them both he created many men and women and he spread them on the earth now religions have been coming uh, and they've all been monotheistic and then people changed it over time allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the quran that in the deen and allah is islam the only religion in the sight of allah is islam so allah will accept islam from you which is basically what is known as submission to allah islam literally means two things it means submission and it means peace when you say assalamu alaikum is islam is in there somewhere assalamu alaikum which means peace be upon you so islam salama basically means peace and also salim basically also means uh, submission surrender so basically what islam is is that you find inner and outward peace by surrendering yourself to allah that's what islam is so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says inna ad-din and allah al-islam the only religion in the sight of allah is islam that is what is acceptable everything else is not so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam now is the final messenger no one can say that i believe in allah but sorry i don't believe in the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam if you say that then you're not a muslim you're not submitting to allah because he's telling you he's the last messenger as you say i follow everything but i follow up till i follow ibrahim and yaqub and daud and suleiman and i and i follow isa and musa and i don't follow muhammad then this is not okay you have to be up till the, the uh, up till the last prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and so what about those people who died before the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam who never believed in him because the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam didn't either have prophethood at that time or uh, he wasn't even alive at that time but sir was his uh, being the last messenger was in that mentioned in bible and all the other books Uh, yes it was but 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 that's uh, basically for us to know that he has been mentioned in previous scriptures that he will come but the thing is the people haven't seen him yet so they knew that this that someone's coming who's coming but they didn't know that so they didn't know his what his name would be although uh, muhammad has been mentioned in the torah um, it has been clearly mentioned which they have conveniently translated as all together lovely and sheikh ahmed didat he he was a person who used to debate with the christians a lot and he would say you have no right to translate people's first names you have no right like for example if i was to write a book on uh, myself and uh, i write the book that you know my name is ya and this that and the other and, and so years later somebody translates that from english to some other language and to ya they change it to the light that and so the light was born and the and the light <laughs> came to comsats and so and you're like well, what light came to comsats i mean was there uh, yeah, there was a problem with the maintenance or something or what happened so you have no right to translate people's first names you know so if you do that then the context is completely so what they've done is actually the word muhammad if you read it from the hebrew and I, and i have that uh, recitation in the hebrew he says muhammadin and they've changed it into all together lovely when they translate it the, you can actually hear the guy saying muhammad you can actually hear the recitation Okay. So uh, and after that they also said that the whole context is Song of Solomon. Yeah, 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 that's right. So they said that the whole context is about a woman praising her husband and stuff. Yeah. So where does Muhammad comes over here? And they yeah. said that too, they, uh, they were just waiting for something to happen. Yeah. So they said that it's a wrong claim that Muhammad's word came. Yeah. Over here. So like. 
Okay. Yeah, when you, um, I've actually got the Bible in my house, and when you read the translation of it, so Suleiman alayhi salam is saying to someone that after me will come someone who is like this, he will be like this, he will be like this, and he's explaining the characteristics of this person. And the second last sentence he says is that he will be Muhammad, and so they translate it as and he will be altogether lovely. And so that's what that. So if you look at the context, that's what the context is. So, and then even in uh, the Bible or the New Testament, he has been mentioned as someone who will come. And Isa is actually saying this, that uh, after me, that don't think that the message has finished yet. It hasn't. Because after me, someone will come who will complete the message and complete the favor and all of those things. Alhamdulillah, it's, it's also there. But the point being that even if a person died at the time of Isa a.s. and he did not believe in the Prophet a.s. and yet he believed in Isa a.s. as the messenger of Allah, not the son of Allah, then inshallah this person is also clear. The person who was at the time of Musa a.s. and followed him and was, was a Muslim actually, then this person is also clear. The one who died at the time of Ibrahim a.s. and believed in Ibrahim a.s. and didn't believe in Musa, Isa or anybody else after that, then even this person is fine. But when the messenger is there, so basically what was the prerequisite at the time of Adam a.s. His children believed in Adam al and nobody else. That's fine for them because he came with his Sharia, his law, and the Nuh al people came with their own thing. And so throughout time, prophets have come. So the prophet of that time, you have to believe in that prophet and those before him, and the pure message of Tawheed which has been there for all the prophets. All the prophets have said what? Inaybudullah wa jtanaybud ta'ud. Ittaqullah wa atiyun. Fear Allah and obey me. Fear Allah, obey me. And Allah SWT mentions this again and again in the Quran that and so and so said to his people, Fear Allah, obey me. And then this Prophet said to his people, Fear Allah, obey me. So the Prophet said the same thing. That you have to, yani Allah SWT says, Ati Allah wa Rasul, obey Allah and obey the Messenger. So for us now, today, in this time, we have to follow Allah SWT through the book of Allah and we have to follow the Prophet in his sunnah. In the way that he has told us. How do we pray? We pray like the Prophet uh, ﷺ prayed. We cannot say that no, I believe in the Prophet ﷺ, but yet I will pray in my own way. So my prayer will be just jumping up and down 20 times and saying Allahu Akbar. That's my prayer. I, I can't do that. The Prophet ﷺ never taught that. If you did it, you're not following the Prophet ﷺ, you're following your own nafs and your own desires. And so we can't do any of this, uh, inshaAllah. So the thing is, for us it's important that we live and die as Muslims. That's why Allah SWT says that, Ya yulazina amanu taqullaha. Hakka tuqati, wala tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. O you who believe, fear Allah as He should be feared, and do not die except that you die as Muslims. So Allah SWT is saying, do not die. Please do not die. Can you control that? Allah SWT is saying, do not die, but if you have to die, then die as a Muslim. If you really must die, then die as a Muslim. Because otherwise, it's not going to be a pretty picture. You should live and die upon Islam. That's why we make dua that, oh Allah, let us let the last words that come out of mouth be Ashadu Allah ilaha illallah. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said that the one who dies knowing and saying Ashadu Allah ilaha illallah, dakhil al jannah, he will enter paradise. And the Sahabi said, ya, uh, ya Rasulullah, should I tell this to the people? He said, don't tell them yet. Because it will make them leave righteous actions. They will become lazy. So don't tell them. But the Sahabi did tell later on. Because what this would do is that maybe you might start thinking that you know what, I'll die with la ilaha illallah. But, but you know what, saying la ilaha illallah in your death is not as easily done as we can say it. Because there are many people, there was a um, doctor from um, Australia, he was a Muslim. And he said that uh, around, I don't know, close to about 46 people he said have died on my operating table. He was in ER. He said there are about 46 people who have died on my operating table who were Muslims. And to each of them I said, Kulu la ilaha illallah, say la ilaha illallah. And only two of them were able to say it in his lifetime. He said only two were able to say it. And I said it to 46 of them, but they weren't able to. So you know what, when you are in the stupors of death, stupors of death is that intoxicated state of death. When you're about to die, you know it's a crazy state. It's a, you, you're just kind of losing consciousness. You're losing focus. In that moment, will you remember Allah? Or will you remember something else? That's the thing. Because many people, the stories that we've heard is that many people at the time of death, they say whatever their life was about. If your life was spent with finances, these people even at the time of their death, they're calculating finances. 
the people who live their life upon uh, other things, that's what they're talking about. And uh, there are many stories that Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah, he mentions in his book about the stories of people dying and how people tried to tell them to say la ilaha but they couldn't, but they, but they weren't able to. Someone is saying, no, I want to listen to that music, I want to listen to that, to that song, and so on. And this Sheikh, uh, who was from Australia, he said that uh, they, they attended two emergency cases. One of them was, he said, two Lebanese boys who were driving on the highway and their car had an accident. And so when the ambulance reached them and he got out and he tried to save them, uh, and other medics got out as well, he said that, um, I said to them, say la ilaha illallah, because I knew that they were completely, uh, almost near death. But he said that they were singing the same songs that were playing in the car. And I kept telling them, please say la ilaha illallah, please say it, and they weren't, and they were just singing songs. And he said that's how they died. And he said that one time, um, a case was that, he said that there was a truck that hit a boy, he was probably about 20, 21 years old. He said that he was uh, parked next to the road and he was repairing his tire. His tire had punctured and so he was repairing the tire. And so a trolley or a truck came by and you know how sometimes people are doing something on their phone and he just sort of strayed a bit off the road a little bit and he hit that boy. And he was hit so hard that he was uh, in a very critical situation. He said that's when the ambulance came, we came out, we took the boy, he was in a bad state. We loaded him up into the, into the car, uh, into, the, in, into the back of the ambulance and we began to drive. And he said that as we were driving, we heard this most beautiful recitation of the Quran coming from the back. And he said that he was reciting ayat uh, that um, when Allah subhanahu wa says in the Quran that um, come back to Allah subhanahu wa that oh my, oh my dear servants, come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a state where Allah is pleased with you and you are pleased with Allah. Come back to the Jannah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and come back into the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's, uh, and his righteous slaves. So he is reciting those ayat in a beautiful way. And he said that then after that we heard like a deep breathing, a big sigh. And then we heard him say, Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah. And he said that as soon as we heard that, there was just silence. And he said, I looked back to see in the car and I checked his pulse, he was dead. And he said, as, 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 I, as I shook my head to, to the driver that he's passed away, both of us began to cry. Because it was such an overwhelming experience for us that this boy passed away by saying, Ashadu Allah, ilaha illallah. And when they asked his parents, when you know, finally they took him to the hospital and they called the parents and found out, they said that when he called his parents and we asked him that, you know, who was this boy? They said that he was a very good boy and he was uh, not only uh, memorizing the Quran and he had m like memorized three Jews or something like that, three paras so far. And he was one of the secretaries of the Islamic organizations or the Islamic student society in his own university. And Masharif was very active, he always wanted to do good things and all that. And so they were crying and telling him the story and he said that, you know, people of righteousness, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes them upon righteousness. And so for him, as far as that boy is concerned, he's in paradise already. He has earned the favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took him and the prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is true. The promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when it came from the prophet is true. He said that whosoever dies upon that will enter paradise. Straight away, that's it. So the life which was a test, he, he aced that test. He aced that, he finished with flying colors. And our scholars would say, it's not how you begin your life, but rather how you end it. Your beginnings might have been horrible. Your beginnings might have been messed up. But what's important is how you cross that finish line. How you actually end that exam paper, that's what's important. So we can make mistakes, but inshallah, we need to understand that Allah Ta'ala can forgive. And as long as we die upon forgiveness and righteousness, inshallah, that's uh, what is required. So inshallah, I make dua for all of us that Allah Subhanahu Ta'ala enables us to follow in the footsteps of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and may Allah Subhanahu Ta'ala be pleased with us on the Day of Judgment and may He enter us all into Jannat Al-Firdaus. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik, ashadu an la ilaha illa ant, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.